Dr. Darren Ingalls, thank you for joining us at Women's Wellness Collaborative. Oh, thanks, Bridget. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm glad to have you to talk about a pretty specialized topic and during this really special event that's probably it's close to my heart, it's probably close to you, your heart too as someone who works in environmental medicine. So you are a naturopathic physician, is that right? That's correct, yes. Okay, but before that, you were a... <laughs> yeah, so my, my career started, I was a clinical microbiologist and immunologist. So I work in clinical pathology in Chicago for many years before going back to medical school. So I actually have a pretty broad background in infectious diseases and microbiology. Okay, what, what got you first interested in that subject? Uh, well, uh, my, my undergraduate degree is actually in medical technology. So we're the guys that work in labs. Every time you have a blood sample, urine sample, uh, that goes off to us. And we're the ones who actually do the testing for the various uh, things that, you know, doctors are looking for. So, you know, I had a very broad background in, in that, uh, but I was just particularly interested in uh, microbes, uh, bacteria and viruses and parasites. So that's where my interests uh, lie, and uh, that's where I started working. And the lab I worked at actually did microbiology and immunology. So then I got to learn a lot about various tests for immunology, and um, I just always thought it was very fascinating. Oh, awesome. Well, it's a great, great background. I'm glad, glad I met you and found you because... I don't know much about this topic. You know, I, when Harvey struck, I, I just, with my own mold background, I was like, oh gosh, people are going to be getting mold. Um, yeah. But then I started to think, well, what else is going on? Well, what's in that, what's in that flood water? I looked up a little bit of information about, you know, how mosquito populations may change and, and just wanted to address for those who are affected by this past storm or any of the, sadly, the future storms that are probably coming, um, you know, that they can be aware of, of what to watch out for, for themselves, for their family. So, so yeah, what, where do you want to start off this topic? Well, uh, I think probably the best place to start is just talk a little bit about some of the things we have to watch out for if you've been in these affected areas. You know, maybe fortunately or unfortunately, we have a history with Katrina when it hit New Orleans and the kind of the things that came out of Katrina. So we have some, uh, some evidence and some research that, that came out of that event. And so I think it's somewhat similar to what we're seeing with Harvey and now with Irma hitting Florida they might be suffering from some of these similar issues. So the biggest thing that we have to watch out for is the fact that there was so much flooding. Of course, the mold's going to be a bigger long-term problem. But in the short term, we have to watch out the fact that the sewer systems got flooded. And as that sewage got flooded, it just carried into all that water that now is running into people's homes and contaminating all of their, uh, you know, their walls, their furniture, you know, anything that might have made contact with that water is highly likely to be contaminated with, you know, basically sewer water. And yeah. in that, you get a lot of what we call coliform bacteria. So these are the bacteria that would normally live in our gut. Uh, so uh, E. coli is probably the one that most people are familiar with. So, you know, people have to uh, really be careful about uh, any kind of contact you have with that water just because any type of ingestion or getting into your mucous membranes. So I really think about the people who are down there now starting to do some of the cleanup, uh, you know, have to be very, very careful in protecting themselves so that they don't accidentally either, you know, ingest it, get it to a mucous membrane. I think about open cuts and wounds being a great entry source for these kind of bacteria to cause infection. Uh, so that's probably going to be one of the biggest health risks right now post Harvey is just this massive amount of bacteria that's in that water. And, you know, even after the water recedes, you know, that's those bacteria are still going to live on the surfaces that they touch. So again, whether it's walls or furniture, uh, as the process of decontamination starts, uh, everyone just has to be very, very careful about making sure they take proper measures to protect themselves so that they don't accidentally, you know, pick up these kind of bacteria. Mm. So you said it can stay on furniture that got wet or, I mean, maybe for different organisms, it's different lengths of time, but give us an idea of the length of time these things will stay living. 
Well, bacteria can stay, uh, depending on the bacteria, I mean, they can live for many, many weeks, uh, weeks to months if the environment's right. You know, bacteria themselves, I mean, the reason they proliferate so much in our gut, it's a warm, damp environment. You know, there's water, there's fuel source. So as long as these bacteria have a damp environment and there's some element of fuel, you know, they can continue to grow. Uh, so part of the process of of helping get rid of those bacteria is just drying things out. You know, the best thing that anybody can do when they go to clean up their home is get a dehumidifier and just try and get that moisture out of the air. You know, okay. bacteria really don't like dry environments. You know, in the human body, when you get, you know, ear infections and throat infections, that really can't happen if the mucous membranes are dry. What happens is, you know, someone gets an allergy, they start getting that clear fluid. Now you've got a good breeding ground. When you do get exposed to the bacteria, it just grows very readily. So if we can start to dry out these environments, it's just going to be easier to clean up and there's going to be less likelihood of getting these kind of bacteria. And again, mm -hmm. if we kind of look at the history of what happened with Katrina or post-Katrina, you know, E. coli was really a big one. The other bacteria we saw a lot of was MRSA. That's this methicillin-resistant Staph aureus. So it's highly contagious. It can actually eat away at the flesh uh, in certain cases. Uh, we saw lots of staph infections. Staphylococcus is a type of bacteria that just causes a lot of skin infections. We even saw a, a, an organism called Vibrio. And although most people wouldn't know this by its, its Latin name, uh, Vibrio is a, an organism that back in the old days used to cause cholera. Uh, which was a very dangerous gastrointestinal disorder. Now, there's a different species of Vibrio that we see uh, in after a hurricane. It's not the same organism that causes cholera. Uh, Vibrio cholera is what causes cholera. Vibrio parahemolyticus is a different organism that actually can cause gastrointestinal infections. And actually, we saw a lot of skin infections, mostly in people who were doing the cleanup after Katrina. So, um, those are some of the, the bacteria that can be common in flooded environments that uh, people just need to be aware of. Okay. I have a lot of follow-up questions. <laughs> so, just gonna give me, so when you say the sewer is over flood, I guess I want to clarify there's the sewers like on the side of the road and then there's like the sewers, like the human waste, which I frankly, I don't even understand that whole network and where it goes. Like there's some tanks underground, right? Sometimes under our house that store. Right. Well, ultimately, you know, most sewer systems are all tied into a treatment plant. So whether it's the, the sewer that leads out of your house when you flush your toilet, or it's the sewer on the side of the street that collects rainwater, all of that water is essentially contaminated water. So it all basically goes to a central treatment plant where the water is sterilized, purified, and then can get reprocessed into potable water that we can, you know, drink and use as humans. So at the end of the day, really all of these, these sewer canals and tunnels end up in the same place. And when you get a city like this that gets flooded, uh, again, it gets into those sewer lines, those, uh, those long canals. And they fill up, but uh, as they fill up, that water just floods back up the other direction, and then it gets spread as the water, you know, rises. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, this has been this has been the case really after any kind of major storm, where you know every sewer system kind of has a capacity to how much water it can hold before it overflows. You know, okay. just think of like a toilet overflowing; it's really okay. the same process, just on a much larger scale. Okay, and then somebody who's going to be speaking in this summit had her own home flooded and she was saying that there's a lake in the Houston area I forget the name of it that there's like a dam and they hold it like as long as they can or something and then they let it yeah. out and then there's like a flood so that's I don't know they maybe a different maybe not type of bacteria and organisms in that lake water what do you think well, lake water is going to have its own set of organisms that will be a little bit different than what you would find certainly in a sewer system. You know, there are certain bacteria and parasites that can live in lakes uh, or any kind of freshwater river or lake that we won't necessarily see in a sewer system. You know, the reality is in lake water because, you know, animals tend to poop near water. So lake water can be contaminated with this, you know, this bacteria that we normally see in the gut. Uh, in many cases, you know, the animal gut is not dissimilar from our own gut. So we see a lot of the same type of bacteria. But we tend to see other types of uh, 
uh, specifically parasites that you might find in lake water that you may not necessarily find in, in sewer water. Okay, uh, like so, Giardia, is that? Yeah, um, you can find Giardia. You can find another one called Entamoeba histolytica. Again, a lot of animals can be carriers for these parasites. And again, if they happen to poop near the, that water supply, that can contaminate the water. Uh, there's another parasite called Naglaria. Uh, Naglaria is commonly found in freshwater sources. Uh, and this is one, again, even you know, swimming in a lake theoretically could cause an infection of that particular parasite because it gets pretty easily into your mucous membranes. So um, although it's a little bit different, uh, you still can get contamination. So yeah, I heard that they were going to release the dams in some places uh, just to sort of take that pressure off the system. But uh, even getting flooded with the dam will cause its own set of, of microbial problems. Okay. And same with these bacteria and parasites. Can they be living on a wet couch or a wet rug or what have you? Yeah, you know? they can. And, you know, in the case of the parasites, the, the parasites, you know, because they're parasites, they do need a host. Okay. So they will not survive as long potentially as some of the bacteria. Okay. Um, because again, without a fuel source, uh, they'll eventually start to die off. But in saying that they still can survive for, you know, a, a decent length of time. I mean, certainly it could be days, even up to potentially a week or two, uh, depending on, you know, where it's located within the home. Uh, okay. so again, it, it's possible, uh, you know, we also see potentially a lot of a, a parasite called cryptosporidium. And again, we hear about outbreaks of cryptosporidium that gets into the water supply every now and then, because again, this is water that's contaminated that didn't get treated properly in the treatment plant and then gets recirculated back into people's homes. But because mm -hmm. it can be found again in untreated water as these sewer systems back up, it's possible. And the way that most people get these parasites is through ingestion. So it's something that you would have to, you know, touch if you... You touch with your hands on something, then put your hands to your mouth and ingest it. That's the way you're going to get most of these parasites. You know, bacteria, again, a lot of that tends to be uh, through ingestion. Uh, again, it could also get through an open wound. Fortunately for a lot of these uh, aerosolizing bacteria, although it can happen and it does happen, uh, that is not the more common way that people are going to get infected. So, you know, protecting yourself as you're doing the cleanup um, can be a very effective way to really reduce your risk of getting any of these kind of microbial infections. Okay, so you're saying it's not really airborne and you're talking about wearing gloves, washing your hands a lot, don't put your hands in your mouth. I would think don't have kids, you know, kids are always putting their hands in their mouths. Don't have yeah. kids maybe around when you're doing all this cleanup. Yeah, and I think it might be different for someone whose house might still be flooded. Uh, versus where the water's completely receded. I think, again, the risk is probably higher when you're already working in a flooded area. And I'm hoping that people are going to wait until the water recedes to really get in and start mm. doing that repair work. Uh, okay. Again, that by itself will reduce the risk. Okay. Uh, because, so, you know, okay. when you start getting in and ripping out old material, you know, that's where you have a greater potential to aerosolize some of those, you know, bacteria and parasites and even some of the viruses. So I can imagine if you start uh, ripping out wet drywall and insulation, and if you're just kind of being sort of flipping about it, uh, you know, that will kick up some dust. And again, these particles can live on those dust particles and you breathe them in. And now you could potentially get it through, through breathing it in as well. Uh, okay. So do wear a mask. Definitely. You know, uh, I mean, I recommend there's a specific kind of mask called an N95 mask. This is a very high particulate filter and it really keeps any microbe from getting in. So if anyone's doing any kind of, you know, uh, demolition work on their home, that's a really good idea. And you can find this at any home, you know, home repair store. They're very, very common, but they really are a little bit safer than just a painter's mask in terms of keeping microbes away from their, their mouth and their face. Okay. And you talked about using a dehumidifier. So let, let me give kind of step, wait for the water to recede, it sounds like, and then go in with a mask, gloves, um, maybe a, a dehumidifier if you've got electricity and can get it in there. Is it, I want, I guess I want to talk about what needs to be, to be just thrown away versus what can be salvaged. Uh, well, depending on the extent of the flooding and water damage uh, because of the potential risk for mold, particularly if it's a cloth sofa, um, anything that's porous is probably going to have to be thrown away. 
you know, something that might be made of glass or metal can be cleaned and decontaminated, but anything that's porous because you can get, you know, microscopic amounts of, you know, microbes or mold into areas that if you just wiped off the surface, you wouldn't necessarily know there's a problem. And I've had people who've lived, been in water damaged homes, you know, from rains and other types of flooding that they find, you know, months to years later, they're having a lot of mold issues. So, you know, again, the long-term risk with that is mold exposure. But I think if you've got, you know, books and, you know, clothing, you can probably, of course, uh, wash and salvage, but uh, chairs and couches and anything like that that's porous, you're probably better off tossing. Yeah, I really agree on the porous items. And I mean, from my experience, I think even if things kind of get musty, uh, that's questionable. I mean, books can hold a lot of mold spores. Yeah, uh, <laughs> even if the books were, you know, in another room where there wasn't flooding just because there was so much moisture in there. You know, I think people forget books because they're all paper. They're just basically bound sponges. <laughs> so, yeah, you know, yeah. Uh, that mold... Uh, and I think, you know, what's happened after Harvey, because it's been a pretty long time between when the flooding occurred to when people are now just starting to get back to be able to assess the damage, you know, you've, and of course, it's, it's still hot and humid in Texas. Um, you know, there's gonna be a lot of mold sporulation and those books, if they're there, are just going to be sponges. So as much as I, I hate to get rid of books, I have not found a good way to decontaminate a book, uh, to the point where, you know, we can really be sure that there's no mold in it. And uh, again, it's just uh, safe to to get rid of it so you don't have any kind of long-term health issues. Yeah, yeah, and clothing, I could see maybe if you can get it in there and clean it fast enough, maybe it'll be okay. Um, you know, my brother-in-law, I think is gonna talk on this summit in his home got water damage um, from a different situation. and. I know that people came in to remediate or spraying stuff and they had to wash everything for that reason. But I don't really feel like their clothes got wet or got musty. So I think in that case it was okay, but clothes are also kind of a sponge for these things. And I'd be curious to get your uh, opinion, Darren. So for me, like in my home, it was such slow, long-term mold exposure. Even if you clean your clothes, it's just the toxins are, are still in there. So it's like you can kind of remove a spore. The toxins are harder to remove, but this is a little different situation if things are pretty short term. You know, you're, if you're responding quickly to a known water damage, or do, do you think in that case, things can be kind of remediated quicker and used again? Certainly, yeah, certainly for clothing, I think that's the case. Again, okay. we're not talking about people that have had months of ongoing mold exposure. You know, we're now talking the course of a matter of, you know, a week or two hopefully. Um, so I think in that shorter term, the likelihood of developing mycotoxins, certainly in your clothing is going to be much, much less. And again, you know, I think good cleaning. Now, granted, it may be you have to clean your clothes three times to really get them clean. But uh, I think by and large, what I've seen with people who've had mold damage before, uh, again, if it's been relatively short term, cleaning the clothes is usually adequate to reduce that risk. Okay. Yeah. And we'll have other speakers come on and, and talk about, uh, you're actually the first one I'm interviewing. I don't know where you'll fall in the week. So <laughs> I want to explain a bit of, more about that. So in nature, mold, mold, there's lots of kind of mold and they have co co competitors, but in your home, there can be types of mold growing that aren't having competition and they emit these toxins as a way to kind of establish their turf is kind of one way I think about it. Uh, so yeah, in a long-term situation, that mold can be emitting a lot of toxins over time that can be bad for your health. So the good news, I and mean, there's a lot of bad news, of course, if you've been through a hurricane, tropical storm, but if, if you know what's happened when, and you can react quickly, there's some hope in that, uh, some, some power in that. And it, it's hard to get rid of things that you own. I, I, I went through that. I totally get it. Um, but it's better to, you know, act quickly and make good decisions yeah. for your health. Yeah. And I think, you know, you just have to be kind of honest with yourself as you're going through and assessing the damage, you know, what's salvageable, what's not. And I know it's, it's heartbreaking when you've got things that are very personal and meaningful to you. But um, at the end of the day, your health is the most important thing. And holding on to something that might potentially cause a problem for you down the line, um, it's just not worth it. So. 
Yeah. Um, you know, it's, it's a really hard thing. And I, I feel for everybody who's going through this right now. But uh, I think as, as healthcare professionals, you know, we're always you know, putting your health as a priority. Um, and, you know, anything that might become an obstacle long term. And then you, you and I have both seen people and you've experienced yourself with these long term effects of mold. And uh, it can be really very damaging and devastating for some people. So, you know, it's sort of why risk that chance? You're better off just to go through, do a proper cleanup, make sure that you're not leaving anything behind that might continue to contaminate the home. Because, you know, we know it's going to be a lot of time and effort for people to get their homes put back together. You hate to spend all that time, money, and effort to find out that another year down the line, you're now having this mold issue because it wasn't really properly addressed from the get-go. So it's one of these things, if you just get a leg up on it now, you're saving yourself potentially a lot of grief down the line. Yeah. Yeah. It's in, it's in your home or it could be, but you don't want it in your body. (laughs) You definitely don't want it in your body. (laughs) (laughs) That's harder to get out. So before we move on to health and some testing, um, I don't know if we talked about hookworm yet. Did that come up yet? Uh, No, but uh, you know, yeah, this is kind of an interesting thing. You know, I I think when it comes to parasites, you know, conventional medicine in this country kind of feels like, well, if you haven't been to certain parts of Africa or South America, you know, there really aren't parasites out there, at least they're very rare. Um, I will disagree with that. I think they're actually quite common. We just were not as aware of them as maybe other countries are. And I think because other countries, particularly third world countries, they've got different sanitation issues and immune issues and food issues that we can't really compare. Uh, even though our exposure may be somewhat similar, maybe our immune system can handle it better and we just get less sick from it. But uh, this is one of the things, again, that came out after uh, Katrina is they saw this rise in hookworm. And uh, hookworm is uh, technically, it's called Nicator. Nicator americanus is the, the parasite. And what's interesting about hookworm is that this is actually a parasite that you can get through your skin. This isn't necessarily something that has to be ingested. So I think what they found, particularly in areas of poverty, people were actually walking around barefoot uh, after the storm, and it was literally kind of burrowing through their feet and then making its way to your intestines and your liver. So you can kind of end up with an intestinal parasite, even if you've never ingested it. And so, uh, you know, there's, there's nothing that you would be able to know that you're getting infected. Obviously, these parasites are, are microscopic when they cause infection, or at least you know, very, very small that you wouldn't notice. So this is where wearing proper protection, again, when you're doing a cleanup, particularly if there is stagnant water still present, you, know, you basically want to get the space suit. You want to have you know, nice rubber boots on to protect you from having any of that exposure and giving you know, these kind of parasites a route of entry. Okay. Yeah, you know, there's a parasite summit going on right now, and I just wrote an article about it. And there's still a lot of debate on this one about parasites because we went through this whole last, you know, 20 years of like, oh, we need to embrace bacteria and the dirt and like go barefoot. And, you know, when I say, well, there's dangerous parasites, some people have argued, oh, well, we've always lived with parasites and we can't just kill everything off. It's like, no, we can't just kill everything off, but we do need to be aware. Like you said, I mean, maybe there's like for a while, there was a lack of awareness about bacteria in the gut, but maybe there's been some lack of awareness about parasites that we need to be more aware of. And (laughs) you shouldn't always be going barefoot or eating dirty food. (laughs) Well, you know, uh, not really to go too much off topic, but I think it's an important point about parasites is that, you know, our, our microbiome, is really comprised of a lot of different microbes. You know, it's bacteria, it's viruses, but it is parasites. I mean, we do have parasites that are part of our normal flora. And if you kind of look historically, when we started to become a more sterile society, we started seeing this massive increase in allergies and asthma and obesity. And if you look at countries where parasites are still kind of commonly found and certainly get into the food supply, you know, allergies, asthma, and autoimmunity virtually don't exist mm, at all. Yeah, that's interesting. So there's that's been actually some very good research that, you know, the the eradication of parasites have actually led to other types of health issues. But it's like everything else. You know, there are good parasites and there are bad parasites. Not all parasites are good and not all of them are bad. But there are certain parasites that we would get exposed to as humans that don't really cause disease in humans. Uh, for example, the rat tapeworm. Uh, which we used to ingest through eating grains, Uh, we would ingest it. It can't cause disease in humans, but it can help modulate the immune system. Uh, Mm. So these kind of parasites that don't necessarily cause disease in humans, 
but they do play a role in help modulating our gut function and our immune system. In fact, there's a doctor at Duke University, William Parker, who's done a lot of research on a very specific type of parasite, uh, showing that it has beneficial effects in multiple sclerosis and other types of autoimmune diseases. So I think we're going to start finding that pendulum swing the other direction that you know, a lot of these parasites really are beneficial for us. And we're just trying to figure out which ones yeah. are, are, are the ones. Yeah, that's true too. Yeah. I think, yeah, it, it kind of depends on the situation <laughs> and what you're learning. And yeah, maybe we did get too sterile and then parasites became more of a problem for us. And now we have to swing back another direction. So it's, it'll be interesting to see how that all develops. However, yeah, we, I don't think we should go barefooted and barehanded in an area that has infected water. Yeah, <laughs> I would I would say that's probably a wise idea. <laughs> and we'll go on to talk we'll talk about chemicals in the water, other things in the water too that, that we should know yeah. about in modern life. So it will we'll cover some of that as well. I think one of our speakers will come on and talk about a, a bacteria spray he developed to put in your home to add some good bacteria to the home. So pretty interesting topic as well. So uh, when I first met you as a practitioner, you and you specialize in Lyme disease, yeah, which can be among other, it can, it can be very mixed in with lots of other things, right? Parasites and other chronic infections. So you have a lot of experience in environmental medicine. So what would you, where should we start with this? Talk? Should we talk about symptoms or ways to kind of test your family or ways to kind of keep your immune system up as you go through perhaps one of these natural disasters? Well, I, I think anything you can do to keep your immune system healthy is always a wise thing. You know, again, we could probably have a very long discussion of, you know, nature versus nurture uh, on how our body reacts to germs and, you know, when the immune system is really working at its best. Even if you do happen to get exposure, the likelihood of it causing infection certainly goes down. So I think it would be wise for people to have a little, you know, sort of medicine chest or a toolkit of things that they can keep on hand and take to really keep their immune system primed. And I, I, I think that will really help reduce people's risk as they're going through this process of cleaning up their homes. Yeah. Well, tell so, us what's in your medicine chest. <laughs> yeah. So I think the things that are, you know, easily accessible and well-tolerated, you know, my go-to nutrients. So number one is vitamin C, you know, lots and lots of research of vitamin C uh, as a, an immune stimulant activates different parts of the immune system to help prevent infection. Um, and depending on your age and size, you know, really a thousand milligrams two or three times a day for most, you know, uh, even children to adults is well tolerated. If you get too much vitamin C, you'll know it gives you a little bit of loose stool and you just need to back off the dose. So vitamin C is number one. Number two is vitamin A. And the reason that vitamin A is important is it actually supports part of your immune system called secretory IgA. And these are antibodies that line all of your mucous membranes. So it's your nose, your throat, your intestinal tract. But since this is your barrier to the outside world, if we can keep that part of your immune system happy, when you do get exposed to these things that come in contact with your mucous membranes, your immune system can activate a little faster, and that'll hopefully prevent it from getting deeper into the body and causing a bigger problem. Mm, so vitamin A is a great nutrient. Uh, you do have to be a little bit careful on the dose. There is such a thing called vitamin A toxicity. However, the doses you have to take are really quite high. But I think for any adult who's you know working through this, 25,000 IUs a day, and you do want to take vitamin A with food. It's a fat-soluble vitamin, so you need a little bit of fat to absorb it. 25,000 IUs a day is very reasonable, and for children, 10,000 IUs a day. Uh, okay. And that, that'll help keep that secretory IgA very happy. Okay. So we got vitamin C, vitamin A, and actually vitamin D. You know, vitamin D is actually a hormone. It's not a vitamin, but vitamin D does play a very important role in immune modulation. So uh, even if you live in sunny Texas, uh, where you feel like you're getting a lot of sun exposure, we find in studies where people live in sunny environments, they can still be low in vitamin D because we wear sunblock, we wear clothing, we do things that actually block the sun from helping us make vitamin D. And we virtually get very little to no vitamin D through food. So we really do depend on sun exposure for making vitamin D. Okay. So again, for the average adult, 4,000 to 5,000 I use a day of vitamin D. And for a child, 1,000 to 2,000 I use of vitamin D. And you also do want to take vitamin D with food like vitamin A. Okay. I'm also a big fan of zinc. Uh, zinc is great because it also stimulates the immune system. 
a very specific part of the immune system that directly goes after infections. And zinc itself is actually an antiviral. So in the event that you get exposed to any kind of virus along the way, it has have direct antiviral effects. So for adults, I like anywhere from 30 to 50 milligrams a day. And for children, anywhere from 10 to 20 milligrams a day. Okay. Zinc is a nutrient that you want to take with food, not necessarily for absorption, but zinc on an empty stomach can make you pretty nauseous. <laughs> so having a little bit of food with the zinc uh, just keeps you from, from getting sick. So, you know, those four nutrients is a great little package. Again, you can find these at any health food store. They're inexpensive. And I find that just in terms of keeping the immune system primed, this is just a great go-to and something to keep on your shelf. Okay. Yeah. I think these are all, all fantastic su suggestions and they are all easy to find. I mean, do you have a preference? Like if someone can find a vitamin C with bioflavonoids, would you prefer it with that? Or you're just like not picky? <laughs> so yeah. You energy. know, again, I'm not picky. I mean, personally, I mean, I use bioflavonoids usually for different purposes. So if someone just really needs the immune stimulating benefit, vitamin C by itself, and whether it's buffered vitamin C or ester C, uh, it's kind of dealer's choice on that one. Okay. Awesome. Yeah, that's great advice. Yeah. Uh, well, let's see. What else would you want someone to know health-wise who might be going through one of these situations? Well, the other thing that I thought of specific with regards to Texas is mosquitoes. Uh, just because, you know, it, it is a very humid environment. You do get a lot of mosquitoes naturally. And with all this stagnant water that's now going to be around, I imagine we're going to see this massive explosion of the mosquito population because there's just so many places they can lay their eggs. So I think, uh, again, keeping some sort of natural repellent on hand would probably be a good idea just to keep the mosquitoes away from your skin. Although mosquitoes don't really transmit uh, bacterial or parasite infections, we do see certain viruses. Uh, and again, we've seen little outbreaks of viral infections after natural disasters. So nowadays, you know, there's Zika virus, there's West Nile virus, there's dengue virus. Uh, there's even one that's emerging out of South America, or excuse me, Central America called chicken gunga virus. Uh, so I think Zika and West Nile are the, probably the two viruses that health uh, departments are worried most about in the United States. Fortunately, we have very few cases of them. But again, with this now potentially growing mosquito population, it's something I think we need to at least keep on our radar. So I, I prefer that people not use DEET or some of the toxic chemicals that are typically used to keep mosquitoes away. Uh, but there's a lot of really great natural organic essential oil products available that typically contain any combination of either clove oil, eucalyptus oil, tea tree oil, cedar oil, lavender oil, or lemongrass oil. Um, mm. Some combination of those. And they've actually studied it. Uh, they've done research and they find it actually works quite well at keeping mosquitoes away. So, you know, I might see if you find a health food store or if you have access to essential oils, you can actually make your own concoction. And there's actually a lot of recipes online for doing that. But I see that most of the health food stores out there do carry some version of this and, you know, pick up a, a bottle and spray yourself regularly while you're in that environment and just make sure you're keeping the mosquitoes at bay. That's a good tip. So you're, I'll ask you a loaded question. You so say you're a Lyme expert. I, I think it's been theorized that Lyme is carried by other bugs now too. Do you think that Lyme can be transmitted by mosquitoes? Uh, well, it's not theory. It's actually been proven in research. Okay. So there's at least four studies out of Europe. Interestingly, they haven't done them here in the United States, but in Europe, there've been four studies that have shown that mosquitoes can transmit Lyme disease. Mm, so okay. uh, I think the, the fact uh, that ticks carry most of Lyme, uh, it's not only ticks. Uh, there's been some evidence now that mosquitoes and potentially even fleas uh, could carry Lyme. And, and it, it makes a lot of sense because I do see people around the world who don't live in areas that are typically known to have ticks and yet they have positive Lyme tests and they haven't necessarily even traveled to an area that's endemic for Lyme. So that would make a lot of sense that there's other potential carriers. And, okay. you know, if you think about the way that Lyme is transmitted, since it is you know, transmitted through the blood, you know, via mosquito and another animal, ultimately to a human, you know, any biting insect that, that shares blood like a mosquito, I mean, I think it makes a lot of sense that that's possible. Okay. I, I do find it curious that they really haven't done any research in the U.S. to show that. Um, in fact, I have a friend whose son is an entomologist in Florida who studies mosquitoes. And he says, oh, no, no, there's, there's, there's no possible transmission of Lyme through mosquitoes. And I said, well, you know, here's the research that says otherwise. 
And I don't know that European mosquitoes are any different than, you know, American mosquitoes. So <laughs> I think if European mosquitoes can do it, it's probably likely American mosquitoes do too. So yeah, it's a good reason to yeah, use the natural repellent or wear long sleeves or, you know, stay in after dark. And with the, yeah. with the standing water, I mean, some of that, of course, depending on the situation, but some of that can be removed or, or remediated like if you just have like uh you know flower pots or different things in your yard that you can upturn yeah i mean i haven't lived through this type of storm but i did live in um south america and we had a lot of mosquitoes and when we um just rearranged some water flow in our yard it um it really helped so you know because they, do, they don't travel that far right like no, no, they, they like to stay fairly totally close to home. Uh, but yeah, like I said, you know, anywhere that you've got stagnant water. So yeah, pots, pans, and this is where, you know, even inside the home, if you get these little puddles, uh, just drying out the home first and foremost is the best way to help reduce your risk of mosquitoes. Yeah. And people may not have these laying around, but you can, have, you know, there's water pumps that you can use to move water from one place to the other that, you know, if you could get your hands on might be useful. In those yeah. situations, like if you have a pool and you've had like a little little mobile pump type thing. Yeah. So I just read, uh, it was, I think it was yesterday, that uh, the Texas announced that they've in, in, uh, enlisted the Air Force to come start doing overhead spraying for mosquitoes. Oh, wow. So uh, whoever you bring on to talk about chemicals, you might want to have that conversation because <laughs> oh, you can imagine now that we're going to be, you know, bombing people with uh, chemicals to try and keep the mosquito population at bay. And, uh, oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. We'll see how that, goes. that article. Yeah. They should just do a lavender bomb. <laughs> <laughs> At least it would smell good. Oh, <laughs> uh, well, this is been super interesting information. Anything else we, we didn't cover that you want to make sure we share before we share your resources? Yeah. I think the last thing I would just talk about is just make sure that you have some sort of potable water because mm. I don't know to what extent your, your tap water was contaminated. Uh, if somehow it invaded your own pipes, you know, depending on where you live, if you're on a, a city water or on septic uh, or well water, uh, I would just make sure that your your water is safe to drink before you start drinking it or even bathing in it. So, uh, you know, there are various labs you can use to test your water to make sure it's safe. In the meantime, you know, use bottled water. If push comes to shove, you know, you can boil water that will help kill off a lot of bacteria. Unfortunately, boiling water won't necessarily get rid of any toxin that might be in the water. Mm. It only kills the bacteria. So it's not the safest way. Um, the one thing that I'm a big fan of is that you can buy now these little personal water containers that contain a water filter. They're designed for campers so that they can pull water out of a stream and it, it basically sterilizes it so it's safe to drink. Uh, the one company I like is the company called Grail. And uh, they make, uh, I mean, it's not a cheap, I think it's about a hundred bucks for the, the uh, little water container, but uh, something like that, if you were unsure, might be a worthy investment just to make sure that anything you're drinking is safe. Yeah. Yeah. I, I hope that the city is testing and warning people about what they drink and can't drink. That's great advice. I mean, some of my environmental chemical testing would say, don't drink out of plastic, but this is one time I say you might, you might, you know, if you have to buy plastic <laughs> bottles of water it's yeah I, I think we're we're, <laughs> we're choosing the, between the lesser of two evils but i would rather have a short-term you know exposure to plastic if it means you're right. not going to pick up a potential infection which could be far more damaging so again yeah. hopefully the city uh, will get the water tested quickly uh, and people will know that their water is safe to drink and bathe in but until that time has come uh, i would err on the side of caution and have some sort of you know uh, filtered water yeah, and the bathing is a great suggestion too because we do absorb things through the skin. And I think Americans are used to having a lot of water to bathe in. But also when I lived in South America, I have to bathe out of like one bucket of water. And you can get quite a good shower in with one bucket of water actually. So there's different, you know, or you can kind of mop yourself off. So there's different ways to to clean yourself. Or, you know, I know not everyone in the city was affected. So you can go to an area that, you know, wasn't affected. and if they're, yeah. I, I don't know if their water is clean or not, how big of an area it is, but if you can go elsewhere to take a shower. Yeah. Well, I think the city water issue, because again, you know, most cities have, you know, a central area that supplies a lot of homes. So even if your home wasn't damaged itself, that doesn't mean that your water supply wasn't contaminated either. So True. Um, True. I would just check with your local officials and, you know, maybe call 
uh, whoever's involved with their water treatment and just, uh, you know, talk to them and make sure that the water is safe to drink and bathe in. Okay. So Darren, you were telling me you got a clinic in Connecticut and California, and you want to just tell us more about your work? Yeah. So uh, I have an office in Fairfield, Connecticut and Irvine, California. So I'm a, a bi-coastal practitioner. And um, if anyone's interested, uh, my website is darreningelsnd.com. It's D-A-R-I-N. I N G E L S N is in Nancy D.com. And uh, if people want to sign up, I'll give you information. I have a new book on Lyme disease coming out early next year called The Lyme Solution. And uh, we also have a newsletter. We have a lot of you know really great tips on uh, different matters about uh, environmental medicine, immunology, and microbiology, and things that I'm interested in. So we'd love for people to follow us and uh, you know take advantage of some of that information. Awesome. Yeah. I mean, I think everyone can tell from this conversation that you're really knowledgeable. So if, if you're interested or just kind of want to stay abreast as you go through this experience yourself, or as you take clients through it, um, to just kind of stay in touch and stay aware of the resources. And if you do end up needing some more advanced testing or diagnosis, they could come to you as well, right? Through your clinic. Absolutely. Please. Okay. Great. Well, thank you so much, Darren, for sharing this information. Super helpful and super specific, which I really appreciate as well. Great. All right. Thanks, Bridget.